this is working. Good morning. When I was in my early 30s, I walked into the office one morning and a young engineer that I had just hired kind of leaned her head out into the hall and said, hey Peggy, what color is the number two? Now, it was early. I didn't know the punchline to this joke. So I figured, okay, I'm just gonna answer seriously and then we're gonna figure out where this is gonna go. So I said, actually in my head, it's blue, it's kind of a medium blue, but it's not quite a primary blue. I expected her to kind of get irritated with me for not playing along. But instead, she looked at me and said, I knew it. Okay, now I was really confused. So I said, okay, I don't, what color is the number two? And she got very serious and solemn and she said, Peggy, in my head, numbers aren't in color. Now, my, my mind immediately went to the worst. I thought, she has a brain tumor. She has something horrible. And I'm trying to think, how do I handle this? What do I do? She's new. And as I'm thinking of all of these you know, possibilities, I realized she was still talking. And as she's talking, I realized that she wasn't saying that she had some type of problem or she didn't have any condition. She was saying that I did. Now, as it turned out, she was right. I actually have, let's see if this works, I have a condition that's called synesthesia. Synesthesia is a perceptual phenomenon in which cognitive and sensory stimulus in certain pathways in the brain cause unexpected experiences in other parts of the brain. It's sort of like a short circuit. Um, it's where you have one thing like um, thoughts about an abstract concept and another thing like your sense of smell and they get put together. Scientists have no idea why it happens. It turns out my strongest form of synesthesia is color, called color grapheme synesthesia. And that's what I mentioned before. In my head, the number two is absolutely blue. I, but I also have chromesthesia, where I associate sounds with colors. So to me, the sound of a violin is orange. And if you said, why is it orange? And I would say, because it's an orange sound. I don't know. That's just what makes sense to me. I also have spatial sequence synesthesia. So if we schedule something for a Thursday, in my head, I visualize the week. It's a long oval. The weekend is on one side, Friday's out at the end, and of course, all of the days of the week are in specific colors. Now, I also have a very rare form of synesthesia in which, this is strange, my brain assigns not only genders, but personalities to things like letters and numbers and lots of other things. What basically designates a synesthete, as we're called, is that these associations are always the same. It's the consistency. So, for example, to me, Tuesdays are goldish yellow, always. The letter G is female. The sound of a drum is like a dull beige. And in a very odd association I can't explain, the word or the place name Sussex is not only grayish blue, but it tastes like grape jelly. I have no idea why. Scientists estimate that about 4% of the population has synesthesia of some form, so I'm sure there are people in the room who are saying, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Scientists also estimate that 50% of the population has had some type of experience like this at least once in your life. So I'm sure a lot of you are saying, yes, I've had something like that happen before. Now, once I got used to the idea that I had a condition, then the, the really staggering part hit me. Hang on a second. This means I always thought that we were all doing basically the same thing. It just looked a little different. Maybe number two is red in your head or something like that. Well, this meant that wasn't true at all. Every, that means other people's brains are completely different. I had always thought of brains as sort of like Machines, like we all have the same machine, it's just different people have different parts of the machine optimized. So for example, let's say we're all refrigerators. Everybody's a refrigerator. We all have ice makers. Now, some people, Helen, can make cubed and crushed ice. 
So she has a part that's optimized over the rest of us. And this is the way I looked at brains. So when we said things like, he's good at math, or she writes well, it just meant that that person's part of that machine was optimized. But this realization meant that wasn't true at all. We're not all refrigerators. We're refrigerators and toasters and blenders and cappuccino makers. So once I figured this out, I thought, I, need to, I wanted to understand the way people around me thought, because obviously they didn't think the way I did. So I started paying attention. And if you know me, I've probably at some point asked you some annoying questions. Things like, what is your favorite color? Do you prefer books to movies? This is my way of understanding your mental landscape. And it's a way that I started to understand how people around me were thinking. For example, I used to work with a guy who's probably the most logical, literal person I have ever met in my life. He and I always approach things differently. One day I started asking these kinds of questions. Hey, Chad, what's your favorite movie? I kept starting to go on, and he's the kind of guy, he said, Peggy, why are you asking me these questions? And so I explained, I have this condition, and you know, this is why I'm asking. And this is not an exaggeration. It made sense. This upset him for days. He kept saying to me, that, that doesn't make sense. What do you mean they're in color? What do you mean you're seeing numbers? Why are you seeing numbers? Why would it be blue? His approach to things was very different. And so I kind of visualized his, I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself here, um, I sort of uh, visualized his brain as this black and white set of very precise steps. Um, because that's the way he was. He was very procedural. He liked things that had very constrained parameters. He loved specifications, and which was different for me. Because if you ask me to do something like that, if you ask me, for example, to do a lab test with a bunch of complicated steps, I can do it. If you ask me to assemble furniture, I can do it. I don't like it. It makes me mentally uncomfortable, like I'm wearing a jacket that's too tight. Now, if you ask me instead, if you give me a bridge scour problem with a large drainage area and a bunch of variable erosion channels, I'm in heaven because my brain works in visualization and identifying patterns. He and I think in very different ways. We work together well because we did different things well. So I continue to pay attention to people around me, and I still do. I work with an engineer who sees everything in terms of connections. She sees, she, you can name a person, a job, a resource, and she sees it connected to something else. I visualize her brain as sort of one of those maps at the airport with all of the flights connected everywhere. I work with another engineer, and I see her brain as a sort of school gym during an assembly, because when she's working on something, she insists on getting absolutely every opinion of everybody involved in the project in, and she listens to it before she comes up with any type of conclusions. And then, much like a principal, she will remind everybody of the objective and be very decisive in drawing conclusions. It's a different way of thinking than mine, but again, we work very well together. There are a lot of types of engineering brains. And unfortunately, I think that oftentimes, we as a profession, we get lumped into a single stereotype. And it is the math, the math loving geek. I think of it like the old, the NASA engineers from the 60s, you know, the glasses and the tie and the short sleeve dress shirt, which, by the way, my brother, the attorney, always says, can't you engineers afford the whole sleeve? To which my dad, the engineer, says, when it's warm, the whole sleeve is wasteful and inefficient. Engineers can appreciate that. Unfortunately, I think we tend to embrace this stereotype. We, we take one little sliver of our profession and we put it up on a pedestal and we say, that's a real engineer. That person is doing real engineering. 
And so let's say we say somebody who's doing a complex finite element analysis to do a really complicated foundation design. That's real engineering, which if you do that, you're wonderful, and I'm not saying that you're not. But I think when we do that, we make that the goal. We are telling people, we're telling students and young employees that all the other types of engineering brains are not as important. My dad was a professor of, civil enge of geotechnical engineering for 40 years. And he always said the only thing that we teach you at engineering school is how to solve problems. Almost every problem is multi-layered. And almost every problem requires different types of engineering brains. Yes, we need that brain that is doing that analysis to design that foundation. But it was a different kind of brain that came up with the analysis. It's a different kind of brain that figures out how to go out and construct that foundation in the actual world. And students pay attention to this. It's a different kind of engineering brain that understands the job to get the job so that you actually get paid to do the job. And that is an engineering brain. I think we need to spend more time acknowledging and encouraging all of the types of engineering brains in all of the roles. I think that all of these have the same value and contribution, the same level, although they are different types of contributions. I had a boss very early in my career who said that a good boss figures out what people do well and he gets them or she gets them to do that. He was brilliant. That's exactly right. Oftentimes we don't have the money or we don't have the schedule to do that as well as we would like to do. But we can at least acknowledge that we are not all the same machines doing the same jobs. We need to try to encourage people to be who they are. And we as experienced professionals sometimes need to look around and say, what other perspectives are there? What other types of brains are there? And maybe I should listen to them. When we get people to do what they do well, they thrive. They're happy, we work well together. And then the project benefits, which of course we're engineers, so that's our ultimate goal, right? It's, it is a classic engineering problem. It is the problem of optimizing our resources. And our resources are our engineers. Because, after all, you wouldn't use a cappuccino maker to make toast. But breakfast is far more than just toast. Thank you.